Good morning, Northwest. And I think there's probably some on Zoom, not really for sure. But if you are, normally you're waving, but I don't see you. I do see a screen, though. I do have a screen. And those later on YouTube. Um, it's good to be back home. I, I'm, I'm just going to tell uh, Caleb, I, I'm, being from the South, I know why you're excited about cold weather and the fact that you're looking forward to wearing jackets. It's because you never get to wear a jacket in Arkansas in the wintertime. Yeah, so finally you're going to get to wear some coats. And uh, after about three or four years, you're going to go, uh, this is not so much fun, okay? <laughs> I'm just telling you from experience. No, not really. I, I'm glad to be back home. Sherry's not with us today because she started developing a cough uh, yesterday some and just not really feeling. Uh, we, we actually got up yesterday morning to catch our flight out of Seattle. A 5.30 a.m. flight, supposed to be takeoff time, 5.30 a.m. So we were up at 2 a.m. Uh, after going to bed at about 10, 10.30 uh, the night before, we didn't sleep because we are trying to think, okay, do we have everything ready to go because we're going to get up and we need to catch Uber out to the airport and stuff like that. And uh, so we made it, got to the airport good, had a plane full, and then we uh, proceeded to sit on the runway for probably an hour and 15 minutes, uh, not moving. <laughs> so, so anyway, and then the rest of the day kind of went like that. So it was kind of a long, long day. But uh, you know what? Uh, kind of go along with Aaron's, uh, what we we're talking about in class, looking for the God moments, really didn't bother me because uh, we had such a blessed, wonderful time uh, out in Seattle and then also up at Mount Rainier. Uh, in a cabin and, and stuff like that for a couple of days too. So, so anyway, and Alan's not here today, but I was just going to uh, thank Alan Moreland for last uh, Sunday morning. Uh, that was such a powerful, uh, transforming uh, teaching that, that Alan did last week and, and for the whole gathering for all of you as participants uh, and all of us are participants. I mean, not just the ones that maybe just did the, the scriptures, scripture readings from the, from the songwriters of the Old Testament. But uh, it, it was powerful because it related so much uh, to, to what's going on in our world today. And, and, and the fact that, that, you know, we need to lament. And, uh, and that's something we do not talk very much about. I think most of us, uh, myself included, uh, we, we seek peace, don't we? Uh, I think all of us seek peace, but yet very few of us, if any of us, live an entire 24-hour period in complete peace. Normally, uh, there's going to be at least one thing, if not maybe several things and several voices that are calling out to us and kind of wrecking our day, kind of throwing us off just a little bit and the peace that maybe we're enjoying uh, at, at the moment. And there's so much noise, so many distractions. And I think all of us, we, we crave just, just a sliver, uh, sometimes maybe just an island, uh, a small, tiny island of tranquility that we can go to to, to to have that peace in the middle of sometimes what is a very turbulent day. And just looking at our world and what's going on in our world today. Trying to find that peace. And again, what I want us to do, and you can go ahead and open up to Mark chapter 6 this morning. And that's where we're going to be pretty well camped out for the next few minutes. I want us to look at our rabbi. That's what we've been talking about all year is taking Jesus as our rabbi. He has called us to be his followers. 
He's our teacher. That's what a rabbi simply is. A rabbi is a teacher. And a rabbi has Talmudim that we talked about at the beginning of, last, of this past year, which just simply is a disciple, a follower of a particular teacher. But it's more than just a follower. Actually, uh, it, it is someone who is an apprentice of that particular teacher. So that's why we're looking at some things as we talk about turning off the noise. Because when you look at Jesus, Jesus, there was always noise around Jesus. Constantly. There were constant uh, things that were trying to throw Jesus off track and could have thrown Jesus off off track of what his purpose was when God sent him to this planet to be our Savior. When you look at, when you look at Mark chapter 6, you know, right off the bat, uh, you see Jesus at his hometown of, of Nazareth. This is the town that Jesus grew up in as a little boy. Just stop and think about this. Jesus as a little boy running around the streets of Nazareth. running to people's houses. He had friends, just like we have friends, and we have friends growing up. Maverick, just like you having friends, you know, friends that you like to hang out with, right? Or sometimes friends that you like to go to their house and to, and to visit with them, or them come to y'all's house and to visit with you. That's how Jesus was, just like you. And he grew up in Nazareth with all of these neighbors seeing him and knowing him. This is where Jesus, in Nazareth, this is where Jesus became a man. He grew up and became an adult at Nazareth. And he was a carpenter. That was his profession. And so I don't think it takes very many brain cells for us to use when we can understand where they were coming from as Jesus in, in chapter 6 of Mark, or Mark, he's teaching in the synagogue. And so what they're wondering is, is they're listening to Jesus speak with such authority of the Scriptures, with so much power with so much understanding of God's Word, not quoting all of these other rabbis like a visiting rabbi would do when they would teach in the synagogue. Jesus just look at, looked at the Word of God and spoke with such authority, such confidence, as if he knew God personally, which we know, yes, hello, he was God. He was the Word. But they're wondering, what happened to Jesus? What happened to him? How did he become this, this powerful teacher? He did not go and study theology. Just like all the other kids but, uh, up to 12 years old. Oh yeah, Jesus went to synagogue school in Nazareth. But they knew that he didn't go any further. They knew that more than likely that, 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 you know, he did not sit at the feet of any theologian. He didn't sit at the feet of any rabbi. He was not chosen to be a Talmudin by any rabbi. But yet now here he is back in Nazareth as a rabbi with disciples of his own. So they try to slam Jesus. They, they slam him by, by, by saying, you know what, we, who, who do you think you are coming as? We know you're nothing but a carpenter. And, and it got me to thinking about something. Have you ever wondered why God chose to come as a carpenter, as a profession? Why did God choose to be a carpenter? When, when Jesus could have been anything else that he wanted to be, I mean, after all, he created everything. 
but yet he chose to be a carpenter. And I know y'all are wondering, what in the world did he bring? No, this is not a chocolate candy bar. This is a, a 30-pounder. But I, I, I started thinking about this. And you know, carpenters, what do carpenters do? And I know Tom knows what carpenters do, right? They build. And that's what God is. God is a builder. God builds into people's lives. And the thing about Jesus, Jesus being a carpenter, Jesus could look at a piece of wood. And where I would just see a piece of wood that maybe I'd split and use as firewood or just burn it like it is, Jesus saw potential in just a piece of wood. In their part of the, the world, more than likely, they used brick and made bricks more than they used wood because it was more prevalent. Again, where I would just look at this brick, you know, it's just, Jesus saw potential in every brick. Jesus saw potential in, in the brick that, that uh, you know, as, as he would put these bricks with other bricks, that you could build something substantial. And that's how it is as Jesus looks at every single one of us. As Jesus looks at you, as he looks at me, sometimes we feel like, you know what? I really don't have anything to offer. I really don't have any potential. But Jesus looks at every single one of us, and as a carpenter, he sees potential in you. And he sees potential in me. And every single one of us, regardless of who you are, God sees that potential, and Jesus sees that potential, and he knows that if he builds us together... This is how he builds his kingdom. And I don't know if that's the reason Jesus became a carpenter or not. But I know that he's about building and about building his kingdom. And about seeing potential in every single one of us. And bringing us together. It's not about being an individual. I think for a long time we've been very individualistic. But he doesn't call us to be an individual, an island by ourself, but he calls us to become a building, his building, his body. But, but they also slammed Jesus whenever they, they called him the son of Mary. In their culture, it was male-dominated. It would have been the son of, boy, my daddy is this, so this is the son of... But they knew that Jesus did not have an earthly dad. They didn't know who his earthly dad was. They thought he had an earthly dad. But they also knew that, that his mama, Mary, she had become pregnant before she got married. And so what they were trying to do was create a scandal. They were trying to throw dirt on Jesus. Why are you listening to him? He's illegitimate. He doesn't even know who his earthly father is. And we know that it wasn't Joseph. So they were trying to throw dirt on Jesus. And then when you look down a little bit further, we see Jesus sending out the, uh, sending out the, 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 the workers. He sent out his 12 on this mission. He was sending them out to do the very same thing that he was already doing. And that's what a rabbi does. A rabbi, in order to follow a rabbi, and I pray that we've been doing this this year, is number one, it's just to be with Jesus. That's what, when he called them, to, he just said, just come follow me. Just follow me. Just be with me. So many times we may want to know, well, where do we begin? You begin by just being with Jesus. And as we're with him, guess what begins to happen? Then we become like him. They were actually Talmudim disciples in their day. 
People could look at, at, a, at a, someone who was following a particular rabbi. They could tell exactly who they were following. You know why? Because they dressed like them. They wanted to look just like their rabbi. And that's how it ought to be with us as we follow Jesus. We become like Jesus. And then at the end, what we do is we start doing the things that Jesus did. And so here, right off, almost at the beginning, after they had been with Jesus, they, became, they were beginning to become like Jesus. But before they were fully trained, now think about this, before they were fully trained, they started doing what Jesus was doing. Jesus sent them. Jesus sent them to heal the sick, just like what he had done. Jesus sent them to teach the very same things that he was teaching about the coming kingdom. And Jesus uh, used them and, and, and sent them to, to free people of demonic possession. And it was begin. you know, they didn't have it all together at this point. They were not fully trained. They still made a bunch of blunders. And again, I, I wanted to go through some of this because I want us to think about ourselves and about Northwest here, but not just Northwest, but every single one of us who, who Jesus has built into his body. Are we and are you doing the things that Jesus did when he walked this planet? And if not, why not? Why am I not? Do I feel like that I don't have the potential when Jesus sees potential in every piece of wood to be built into something substantial? Do I feel like, you know what, I don't know enough or hey, there's more stuff I need to learn? How do you think they were feeling whenever Jesus said, okay guys, now I want you to go out by yourself. And I want you to do the things that I was doing. Do you think they were a little leery? And what I'm simply trying to show us is, is that Jesus has sent every single one of us. As his disciple, he said, I want you to go into all the world. And I want you to make other disciples. And, and so we may be sitting back thinking, well, I need more training. I need more of this or I need more of that. But the disciples went. And Jesus told them, don't take anything with you. I want you to go on this journey, but I don't want you to take anything with you except the clothes that you have on your back. Why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus send them out on this very first mission by themselves and say, you know what, guys? I don't want you to take anything. I don't want you to take extra clothes. I don't want you to, to bring food. I don't want you to bring all the camping gear and all the camping supplies and, and in case you need some kind of housing or anything like that. You know, what he was simply doing, what Jesus was doing is, he says, I want you to depend completely upon my Father. I want you to depend on Abba Father. I want you to travel light. When you stop and you think about the message that he has given us, really, the message that Jesus tells us, I want you to take to all the world. Is it hard? Is it difficult? It really isn't. And as we think about the simple message, the simple message that Jesus has given us, we don't need all of these extravagant props in order to present the simple message of Jesus. I think sometimes even as we gather together as a body of believers, regardless of what place we meet, 
Sometimes we feel like that we got to have the best of buildings and the biggest of buildings. We feel like that we got to have all of the, all the flamboyant other stuff in order to attract people, in order to get people to give their life to Christ. But when you look at what Jesus did when he sent this first group out, he says, you know what, I want you to take the, the simple message because it is simple, and I don't want you to be burdened with a bunch of stuff. Don't, don't water it down with a lot of other stuff. That's what I love about Northwest. We just simply get right in the Word and the message of Jesus. He wants us to travel light. What happens? What would have happened if they'd have brought a lot of stuff with them? What if they'd have had a lot of food? What if they'd have had a lot of money? What if they'd have had uh, all of these supplies and all of these clothes? That, you know, what, what would they have been focused on? Number one, they'd have been focused to make sure that they didn't get robbed. No thieves. Or, or, or you know what, we've got to be sure that, that, we're, that we're taking care of the food and that it is properly cared for and that everything is fresh. How many of us today, as we think about what Jesus has called us to, how many of us are wrapped up in a bunch of stuff? See, this message is really for us too, isn't it? It's so easy for us as believers. I mean, we, we need to live more like Caleb with what, two chairs in your living room now? Or do you got more? How many? Two. Two chairs. One for him and one for somebody that might stop by, right? That's it. But you know what? We got to have a house full of stuff, don't we? And we get so entangled by stuff that really this teaching goes back to what Jesus taught them from the very beginning. He told them in Matthew chapter 6, he says, you know what? Don't store for yourselves treasures down here where, where moth and rust come in and, 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 and destroy And where thieves can break in and steal? But you store up yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot touch it and where thieves cannot come in and break in and steal it. See, we get so consumed with our stuff that we cannot present the message and the urgency of this urgent message that can change the world. Our world is in such a mess because sometimes I think we as God's people and Jesus followers, we're wrapped up in our stuff. Uh, Heather and, and Jeffrey live in an apartment right smack dab downtown Seattle. Love waking up and looking out the window and especially when it's still dark. I mean, the, the, the skyline is just right there. The Space Needle is out another window. Mount Rainier is out another window. I mean, I love looking at all of that. And, and they're talking about maybe buying a house soon. And I was just telling them, okay, you're going to have to worry about your roof. You're going to have to worry about the concrete around your house. You're going to have to worry about the grass. you got to worry. You know, there's so much stuff, isn't it? that we get so wrapped up in all of our stuff and taking care of it that we forget the urgent message and the mission that Jesus has sent us on. And all I'm simply saying, church, is please, 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 and myself too, let's not get so wrapped up in the stuff that really just doesn't matter. What should, you know, what, what, what do we profit? What do we gain? if we gain all the stuff in this world, but yet we lose our own soul. And how many others around you need Jesus? And our world needs Jesus. And anybody that owns a house knows it takes bukus of money to sustain what you got. not telling you to go out and sell your house. Don't feel guilty or anything like that. I want us to think about what Jesus called his first disciples to do is to just trust 
our Father, Abba, Father. Which takes us to verse 30 and 31. And this is what I want to bring us to. So in verse 30, the apostles, they returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all that they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place. And there's that word, eremos. The original, the eremos, the quiet place. Mine calls it the quiet place. Some of your translations may read solitary place or lonely place. But Jesus said, hey, let's go off by ourselves to the, to an, to the eremos, to the quiet place, and rest a while. Why did he say this? Thank you, Mark, because Mark tells us it was because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. There was so much activity, so much noise around Jesus and the 12 when they came back that Jesus says, you know what, guys? We need to go to a quiet place. We need to go to the Aramos to where we can be alone, where we can be just us and be with the Father, Abba Father, to get rest. Jesus and his apostles, they were so overwhelmed so overwhelmed, Pearl, that they didn't even have time to eat. I, 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 I'm, I see Rodney right behind you. I'm, I'm sure, Rodney, in your profession, I'm sure there's times that it's easy to get so overwhelmed that it's easy sometimes to work right through a meal because it needs to be done. It needs to be done now. And I'm sure most of us who have been out in the workforce that I can remember times that I just worked right through my I didn't have time to eat. And after about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, you know what? I didn't even think about it anymore because that, that hunger pain that I was feeling, it was gone. But I was so overwhelmed with what I was doing with my job. I didn't even have time to eat. And that's where Jesus was. And that's where the apostles were. And that's why Jesus said, so guys, I want you to come with me. And I want you to go to a quiet place. And I'm sure that every single one of us, we find ourselves sometime during our day, there's so much noise, so much distraction, that we crave that little sliver, that little tiny island of tranquility. And today I want to encourage you to listen to, to one of the Psalms and, and just to take a moment during those times. You know, last week, uh, my sister, Tricia, the one who lost her husband, and I can't talk and find the scripture I'm looking for, Psalm 40. But last week, her, her husband's been passed away for a little over six months now. And it's been overwhelming. Uh, number one, the grief. Uh, they were married for 60 years plus. She depended on him for so much. And last week, she had had eye surgery to remove cataracts. And she woke up the next morning with a lot of pain and not able to, to, to see clearly and a lot of blurred vision and different things like that. And she had already called her eye doctor. And Stephen's probably already diagnosed him, whatever. I don't, you know, I think it cleared up. She just kind of freaked. Because she got on and she had already made a, uh, an appointment with her eye doctor, for, for doctor the first thing they opened up. 
And, and she, was, she was panicking. She said she was. She goes, I, I, I'm anxious. I'm very worried. I am stressing really bad right now. And she sends this message out to us siblings. There's five other siblings. And you remember what your mama told you or, or maybe your dad too? Whenever you have something to tell them and, and, and you've been running and, and you're breathing hard and, and you're trying to talk and, 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 and they can't understand what you're saying. And you remember what they always said? Slow down. Just stop. Breathe. Take a breath. And so as we've been studying about the Ramos and studying about Jesus, I just encourage my sister to just slow down, take a breath. Matter of fact, take about 10 breaths. Breathe in. And then breathe out slowly. And as you do that, follow with the psalmist all through these songs. What we see over and over and over again. And in Psalm 40, verse 13, the psalmist here writes, Please, Lord, rescue me. Come quickly, Lord, and help me. What I have been doing for the last several months are one word prayers. And they're, they're called breath prayers. When I find myself overwhelmed and I need the Ramos and I'm in a place that there's no way that I can go away by myself to just a quiet place, I find somewhere to just step aside for a moment and breathe because I need to take a breath. And I breathe, and as I breathe in, I just simply say to myself, or sometimes out loud if I am alone, I say, come, Jesus, come. And then just breathe out. And then just take another one. Just come. Breathe out. Other times I may pray for the Spirit to come. Come, Holy Spirit. And breathe out. And I hope this doesn't sound weird because it works. It allows us to focus not on the stuff around us and the chaos around us, but it causes us to focus on the one who's always with us and to remind us that he is always with us. You remember Jesus on the boat during the storm? And as that storm was brewing, the disciples, man, they were freaking out. They were overwhelmed with, with trying to keep the boat afloat, thinking they were going to die. You remember what Jesus was doing? Sleeping. Now, let me ask you a question. Which one would you rather have been? Would you rather be the disciples that are literally freaking out of their gourds with worry, thinking that they're going to die at any moment? Or would you rather be Jesus and with Jesus asleep because everything is so calm. I would rather be with Jesus. So your action this week, and, and what I want to encourage you to do this week, I want to ask you to just try that. When you find yourself stressed, when you find yourself just completely overwhelmed, just take a moment and just breathe. Breathe him in. Just one word. It doesn't have to be Jesus. It doesn't have to be a Holy Spirit. 
It could be another word, or it doesn't have to be anything. Just, just, just breathe in and, and breathe out and let God, let our Abba Father calm us. Bring us to the Ramos, even if we're in the middle of a storm. Which really brings us to the Lord's Supper. This, this to me is a time of celebration, but you know what, guys? It's also a time for me to be communing not only with you and us with one another, but we're communing with Jesus. This is an aramos for all of us because I pray right now that this takes your mind off of everything around you, all the noise, all of the distractions around you right now.